The actual title of this, uh, of this program tonight is How Undoing the Cause of Diabetes Also Undoes Alzheimer's Risk. It doesn't just undo risk, it actually helps reverse many aspects of symptoms associated with Alzheimer's disease and actually helps reverse cognitive decline. This is, um, I, I've spent the last 30 years practicing lifestyle medicine, and during that time, I realized that to be effective in treating chronic disease, I first had to be effective at understanding the underlying causes of diabetes and helping people reverse diabetes. Now, uh, Dr. Westerdahl and I have the privilege to be founding uh, board members of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, which, which started in, was it 2003? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we, we were just a small group, but there was probably 11 of us that started it at Loma Linda University. And now it's an organization that has thousands of health professionals, mainly physicians uh, involved. It's an international society of medicine that is probably the fastest growing society of medicine in the world. And so uh, we're excited about that because you know, there was a few years there where you know, a couple of mistakes in running conferences and we were having to put money out of our own pockets to prevent bankruptcy. And now the organization is very, very uh, healthy and doing well. But that or, uh, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine has established itself as a, a, a a field of medicine that is not satisfied with managing diabetes. It's a field of medicine that's not satisfied with, with managing symptoms of Alzheimer's, with managing symptoms of heart disease, high blood pressure, cholesterol, et cetera. The, this organization was really, uh, we, was organized specifically to help people literally undo those conditions. In other words, if we effectively address enough of the triggers, the, the, the enough of the underlying factors that are driving any given chronic medical condition, we have a very good chance to at least slow that process down, that pathologic process down. Uh, but most of the time, when I say most of the time, we're talking about 80%, 90% of the time, we can even stop the progression of that decline, of, that, of that, that march towards dysfunction in our lives. Uh, and then maybe 80% of the time, in my experience of 30 years practicing this, we're able to help people reverse the condition altogether. This also applies to cognitive decline. Those numbers also apply to cognitive decline. Now, it... it the only reason I can stand here before you and say that can, with, with, with a sense of authority and, 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 uh, is because I have been there and I've seen it over and over again. Just like for the past 30 years, I've seen people be able to not just manage diabetes, but to be able to reverse it. Not all the time, but most of the time. And what's most important is that we're making individuals better by addressing the true issues rather than just placating the symptoms associated. So the ongoing theme this weekend will be how, how using the principles that we learned decades ago that work in reversing, undoing the causes of diabetes, reversing prediabetes and diabetes and the actual main drivers of diabetes, which is insulin resistance uh, uh, and, and uh, the failure of the pancreas to be able to produce as much insulin as it used to be able to, we can actually reverse those things now. So if we can undo that, we have learned that that applies in a very significant way to undoing the causes of the majority of chronic diseases. And that, you know, as a, as a practicing uh, specialist, that you can't imagine how important that is to me. I would hate to be able, I would hate to have to go to my clinic every day 
and, and just tell them, well, I'm so sorry. We just diagnosed you with Alzheimer's. A actually, a, a colleague of mine who, who's a physician in, the, in Northern California, in fact, he's on the faculty of the University of California, San Francisco, and he, he teaches residents in the area of geriatrics. And we were on the phone just a few months ago, and uh, we had actually trained at similar uh, conferences and, and attended the American College of Lifestyle Medicine meetings together. And, and he said, he says, Wes, you know, you know what, we, what I teach my residents? There's the three most important words that you can tell somebody who's just been diagnosed with early Alzheimer's. Because that's, that's what we spend most of our time as geriatricians. We spend most of our time actually diagnosing these different forms of cognitive decline. And he said, I teach my residents to use these three words. I'm, finish it with me, so sorry. And he actually knows that that's not necessary. He has the same knowledge that I do, but he's in a system that doesn't allow him uh, to actually focus on the underlying causes of the problem. And, and it, it kind of, it made me sad, but it also, it made me grateful that I'm able to work in a system that isn't, doesn't bind me to, to, uh, to strategies that ultimately are going to fail. So, so the, the, the theme this weekend is undoing the causes of chronic disease across the board. And I just want to just state up front that those of you who have heard about this Diabetes Undone program, it's possible that the very first thing you're thinking of is like, well, that's not, that program isn't for me because I don't have diabetes. Well, just, let's just take a break for a second and, and, and contemplate this. It's... It's true that the majority of Americans do not have diabetes. But did you know that the majority of Americans do have prediabetes? And prediabetes increases your risk of a heart attack or a stroke nearly to the very same level that diabetes does. In other words, by the time we reach the point of prediabetes, we're ready at a huge increased risk for heart attacks and strokes, but also at a huge increase for Alzheimer's and the various forms of cognitive decline. Right? And so, in my mind, you know, I've been doing this a long time, the last thing I want to happen is to lose my ability to function in the activities of daily living. Right? That's the, that's the last thing. You know, I, I can handle pain, okay? I mean, I don't want to have pain, but if, if, but, but if I have to choose between pain and, and, and a functional brain, right, <laughs> there's no comparison there. So, so currently there's this thought, this perspective that there's really nothing that can be done. Once you start having more and more of those senior moments, Okay, and they're not even senior moments anymore. They're like middle-aged moments, right? <laughs> I mean, the reality is we all have them, right? If we're honest, like, oh, man, I would have, I'm not going to tell anybody because, you know, somebody might take my driver's license away, right? So that it's, it's critical for us to un understand that there is hope, and that's the whole purpose of what we're doing here. This progress. So one out of two of us, who are in our early mid-years, that is between the age of 40 and 59, one out of two, and that's, this is the last year I'm going to meet in that group. I'm 59, and so this is the last year I'm, I'm out of the, we call the 50% group. 50% of people from 40 to 59 have prediabetes minimally. At least that. Half of us. Now, if we're older than 59, that bumps up immediately to two out of three of us. If you're over 75, that bumps up to three out of four of us, 75%. Okay? In other words, put aside the idea that the concepts of diabetes and done don't apply to you because they probably do. 
And even if you had a test this week that showed that your hemoglobin A1C is less than 5.7, and therefore the interpretation is that you do not have prediabetes, guess what? Three-fourths of people who currently have diabetes are, in, are, are improperly ruled out as having diabetes by the hemoglobin A1C test. Now, don't misunderstand me. The hemoglobin A1C test is that caramelization test. It's that measure of how sugar irreversibly binds itself to proteins in your blood, in your body, and therefore cause pathological changes and damage to our body. So it's a great test. I do that test on everybody, even children. But, but it's important to understand that it's not the most sensitive test. It is, it is actually very insensitive for catching early problems associated with insulin resistance. And, and like I said, three-fourths of people who actually have the problem are missed by just looking at the hemoglobin A1C. That's why we need to look at blood sugars after meals. Yes, it's good to know what your blood sugar is before breakfast fasting. That's, that's an important number. But I can't tell you how many patients I have who have perfect fasting blood sugars who are actually diabetic. When you give them something sweet to eat or a lot of carbohydrates, their blood sugars go up above 200 at two hours. And that is the most sensitive official test to diagnose diabetes. If the blood sugar goes up above 140 two hours after any meal, that's pre-diabetes. So, so that's the most like, so that's the best thing. So if you, if you don't like testing at all or don't want to spend the money for any kind of testing, at least find somebody with a, a glucometer and check your blood sugars one and two hours after, after any meal, and that'll tell you what your tendency is. That's the most sensitive blood sugar test for evaluating your personal risk for prediabetes or diabetes. But even before your blood sugars start to go up, your insulin levels, your pancreas is trying to prevent that from happening. So your pancreas is producing a tremendous amount of insulin. And that high level of insulin is one of the main underlying reasons why people develop all these other complications associated with diabetes. But these complications happen way before anybody develops diabetes. And in many cases, those patients never develop diabetes. So the very same cause of diabetes is the main cause of high blood pressure, high, high triglycerides, okay, and abnormal lipid profile, weight gain, Skin cancer, colon cancer, we'll talk more about that tomorrow evening, um, uh, breast cancer, uh, ovarian cancer, most, the most common cancers are dramatically related to this insulin resistance, and yes, dementia, especially Alzheimer's. So Alzheimer's, people get confused between what is it, dementia or Alzheimer's, <laughs> right? Uh, dementia is the bigger term that covers about several dozen different types of dementia, but they're all forms of dementia. Alzheimer's represents the number one problem associated with dementia, which represents about 80% of all people with dementia have Alzheimer's. Um, ironically, if, you wanna, if you're going to be diagnosed with some type of dementia, in my opinion, with my experience, I'd rather it be Alzheimer's. The other forms of dementia are much more difficult to manage. We don't, we don't give up, but it's a lot easier to actually address with the underlying principles of dementia. Okay, so, so the, the, the key issue here is understanding the, the very strong relationship. If we can effectively, through a comprehensive lifestyle medicine program, uh, undo diabetes, by doing that, we actually undo all the other things that are, main, that are, that are challenging our health. Um, OK, so um, a few, well, 1995, Dr. Suzanne de Lamont at Brown University 
a neuropathologist and professor at the university, was doing research on the brains of patients who had passed away with Alzheimer's. And she was trying to better understand what are the differences, how these brain cells, these neurons work. And what she discovered through tedious research was that the brains of people who had died from Alzheimer's were very resistant to insulin. So that began the whole discussion that Alzheimer's is really an insulin resistance of the brain, which essentially is diabetes of the brain. And that is why now uh, many, many researchers are talking about Alzheimer's disease being literally type 3 diabetes. And this is why individuals with type 2 diabetes are actually at a much higher risk of developing cognitive decline, including Alzheimer's. Now, the, the increased risk is about twofold. You know, it's twice as likely, which is significant, right? That's, that's, worth, <laughs> that's worth paying attention to. But, but actually, I believe the number is much higher than that because the actual drivers, the underlying triggers and drivers of dementia, of cognitive decline, actually begin way before that the threshold of di type 2 diabetes is reached. In other words, the pathology is already there in full force even before somebody's diagnosed with prediabetes. So, so, so let's, let's step back and analyze this. In other words, at least half of us in this room, uh, and, and probably on average two-thirds of us in this room, have at minimum prediabetes. Those of us who do not have prediabetes, most of us are going to have insulin resistance because the pancreas is cranking out all that extra insulin to compensate for that and therefore keep the sugars below the prediabetic threshold. Now, here's, the, here's another problem. 90% of us who have prediabetes don't even know it. Okay? okay? And so a lot of people are walking around thinking, Oh, you know, this diabetes undone stuff, I don't need to pay attention to that. I had a checkup with my doctor and said everything was fine. But see, those were all with fasting blood sugars. That is not, that is not picking up insulin resistance at all, okay? At least certainly not in the first 10, 20 years of insulin resistance. And it's not, and it's not picking up the pre-prediabetic syndromes, which are already fully driving the problems with cognitive decline, heart disease, stroke risk, hypertension, and so forth. Okay, so, um, so that, that, with that introduction, okay, I, I'm encouraging you to be thinking about people in your lives that could potentially benefit from what the church here is going to be putting on together starting next Sunday, is that correct? in terms of there's, there's actually an opportunity to get that hemoglobin A1C test done, a full lipid profile at basically rock bottom, bottom prices, a great contract with the, the, the hospital. And, uh, and so those labs will be drawn Sunday. Then roughly, uh, roughly eight weeks later, it will be drawn again so you can see a pre and post. So you can see how the Diabetes Undone program has improved all your parameters, even if you're not technically pre-diabetic. Let me explain. Let's just say your hemoglobin A1C is 5.5. 5.7 is the beginning of prediabetes officially, right? Okay. And so you might be thinking, well, I'm good. But actually, 5.5 is not a healthy level. It's not prediabetic, and that's good in that sense. But it's actually too high already. It already represents a significant increased risk for heart attacks and strokes compared to a level of 5.1 or less. And so the goal is always to do our best to keep coming down. Every little improvement from wherever we started is good. Optimal, if possible, is at 5.1. Just yesterday, I met with um, uh, a patient for the first time. It was actually on the phone. 
Uh, she's from Minnesota, and she had just seen some of the videos online uh, that churches like this put up <laughs> uh, from live streaming. And um, <clears throat> she said, I need some help. And she had sent me by email a list of her previous labs in July. Her hemoglobin A1C, remember that, that measure of, of, um, of, of binding sugars to proteins, uh, were, was over 14. It, the, the lab basically said it's so high we don't know how high it is because we can't check it above 14. <laughs> we can't, they, they just, that's where the, the instrument at that hospital didn't go above 14. Now, 14 is like, you're, you're basically taking, you know, sugar crystals out of the blood. You know, these are red blood cells that are just literally crystallized, right? So they're very, very high. Of course, that dramatically increases the risk for clotting, for all kinds of pathologies. And so, uh, you know, she, but she, she didn't give up. She didn't just say, well, I'm just going to, I'm just, uh, I'm just going to start taking a whole bunch of medication. Now, I'm not against medication, but I'll tell you what, Mayo Clinic just recently published the studies that if you get diagnosed with diabetes and now you focus your management on medicines rather than addressing the actual cause of your problem, actually undoing the multiple causes of, that led to the diabetes, what you're actually doing, even if you improve your blood sugars dramatically, is increasing your risk of premature death. Which, which totally is opposite to what all the guidelines say. And so this is the Mayo Clinic. This isn't Dr. Youngberg saying that. I'm just repeating what they published in a major medical journal, and, and they're right that the risk of, of premature death from, due to kidney failure, due to heart attacks, goes way up when we focus on medication management to the exclusion of actually addressing the problem. So, uh, I tell you why I'm on my soapbox a little bit right now. I just I just spent about half an hour uh, on my dr three hour drive from uh, Temecula, California, which is halfway between Loma Linda and San Diego, uh, and 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 coming here this evening, talking to the wife of one of my patients, who actually uh, had done really well to re he actually reversed his diabetes about ten years ago. But he was a multimillionaire, and um, and was having a difficult time with the demons in his life in terms of the challenges and and uh, the the underlying factors that drove his diabetes, and it basically gave up. Yeah, he's the nicest guy ever, nicest guy ever. Loved the guy. But, but somehow, he, even though he, he had learned how to do it, and he did it, but then he fell back from that and was never able to come back and actually do it again. He just, his wife was telling, he, he passed away on Monday. Just a few weeks after his 61st birthday. Now, that, that really kind of hit me because that, that he's just a year and a half older than I am, and and he succumbed to the ravages of diabetes because he was unwilling to address them appropriately. And his, his wife, um, you know, we kind of uh, reminisced about the way it had been and what could have been and what did happen. And she, uh, at one point, actually laughed with me and she said, you know what? It's funny. Um, my husband, he would go around telling everybody else about how you had helped him reverse his diabetes way back when. And this is how we did it, boom, 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 boom. But he did not follow through himself. And, and so that's, that's why I'm a little bit passionate about that right now, because I'm, I'm just feeling the, 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 the sadness of the fact that this is one of my favorite patients. I hadn't seen him. I saw him once a year ago. He came in once and never came back. Um, and one of the reasons for that is because his blood sugars had gotten so bad, they said, well, we need to put you on a pump. And he got it in his mind that as long as he was taking enough insulin to control his blood sugars, that he was okay. It does not work that way. OK? 
okay? The complications uh, come on more so related to what we do and what we don't do than how well we manage our blood sugars. I know that, that might sound like heresy, but that was actually the, 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 the final point that the Mayo Clinic study made, is that while we do need to keep paying attention to optimizing blood sugars, how we do that is everything. Did you get that? We, yes, improving and optimizing blood sugars, like I said, getting that hemoglobin A1C down, getting that blood sugar down is important, but, but what is more important than how, how well we lower our blood sugars is how we go about doing it. Are we, in other words, I'd rather have high blood sugar and be on the right diet and the right exercise program and be getting enough sleep every night and, and having a good lifestyle program. You can handle higher blood sugars in those situations than, than having great blood sugars because we're just using more and more medicines, but we're not actually paying attention to the cause of the problem. Okay, so <clears throat> why are we doing this in this church? I love this, uh, this verse in, in the Old Testament that says, "For this is God talking to us. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. So that, that's really why we're doing this. And no strings attached. It's all about hope. It's all about giving people uh, reason to believe that something can improve. This is not the way it's going to be for the rest of your life. When we're talking about undoing diabetes, we have to first undo this, this, this uh, false sense of, of, um, of uh, the determination that, we're, that there's nothing that we can really do, that we're going to have this diabetes for the rest of our lives. It's, not, it, it's only true if we don't address the problem. Sure, if we don't address the cause, of course it's going to be true. Okay? But we're here to show you that there is ways around that. And that's true for cognitive decline as well. Just, just a couple of months ago, I came out with the, this little book called Memory Makeover, How to Prevent Alzheimer's and Reverse Cognitive Decline. Now, the reason I did this is because I was seeing so many families who'd come in and they, and they literally ha had lost hope. And so they had heard that I was helping people reverse aspects of cognitive decline, but it didn't mesh very well with everything else they were hearing. And so they were like, you know, what is it? Is this really possible? Okay, are, are, are you selling snake oil here, basically, right? And so, so the whole point I wrote this little book is it's a, it's a story about people who've gone through this before them, couples who've been struggling with different levels of dementia and how, and how by applying the principles of lifestyle medicine, by applying, uh, addressing the underlying triggers of the problem, and it may be different for everybody, tonight we're gonna focus on some of the fundamentals, um, that they actually had dramatic improvement. And because we only have an hour here tonight together, I'm not going to tell you a lot of these case studies, but I will tell you this. I have had patients at every level of dementia, every level, including patients who've had advanced severe dementia for five years before their spouse started addressing the program, and every single person who looked and ad properly addressed the underlying risk factors showed improvement. I'm not saying that every, that every patient was able to reverse their condition, but they reversed enough that they went from being completely dysfunctional, completely able to do anything in their home, to even communicate with their spouse properly, to being able to communicate and, and, and rejoining the family in their ability to enjoy each other's company again. That is critical. That's what we call the functionality of daily living. Even if that person struggles somewhat with what happened yesterday, I say, so what, at that point, okay? If they can become an integral part of the family again, that is all worth doing whatever is necessary to optimize that. Because you, all you gotta do is talk to a spouse who has experienced this for years 
<laughs> they would do anything to be able to actually have their, their loved one back and be able to communicate with them, sisters, brothers, parents, spouses, etc. So, all right, the, the, so the stories are all there. But um, in the, as I was contemplating how I had introduced this information, I, 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 I caught a glimpse of this wonderful passage from Charles Dickens the tell of, in, his, in his, his novel, The Tale of Two Cities, where he says this. These are the first lines of his book. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. I say that, that if I didn't know better, this opening statement by Charles Dickens best describes the current state of affairs within the field of medicine and the conflict that we're seeing between two sides that are the best of times, the worst of times. This, in my opinion, what I've seen over the last five years in helping people reverse various aspects of cognitive decline and, and pre-diabetes and diabetes and so forth is that this is the best of times. We have an understanding now clinically where just about everybody has the opportunity to dramatically improve their situation. No longer do we need to suffer the, those worst of times where the, 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 we hear the three words, I'm so sorry. You're going to have this condition for the rest of your life. You're going to be on medicine for the rest of your life. There's really nothing that we can do but can just manage your symptoms, and we'll do the best that we can to keep you comfortable. That's not acceptable. The, the science is there. We have, the science is there. We, we have the science available now, but we have to be willing to accept it. It was the age of wisdom. We are in the age of wisdom right now. We have more knowledge about how to do this than ever before, but there's so many people who are saying no that are still in the age of foolishness because they think of the, the hope that we're trying to generate as just foolishness. It's not real. They're not willing to actually read the research that has been published on that. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was a season of light. It was a season of darkness. It was a spring of hope. We are in the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. So we have to kind of choose which paradigm we want to be in here. And that's one reason that, that this church is choosing to, to choose the spring of hope, right? To, to, as we're moving into the winter here, no despair here at this church, right? We're focusing on how to undo these problems and find the best approach. Now, one of the very first challenges when we're dealing with cognitive decline or Alzheimer's is like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, this is genetic. This is genetic. In fact, we know that if you have no Alzheimer's-related gene, right, like a genetic mutation that increases the risk for Alzheimer's, even if you don't have that gene, the average person amongst us will develop, 50% of us, rather, will develop Alzheimer's diagnosis by our mid-80s. One out of two of us, that's without the genetic predisposition. That's how, that's how powerful this is right now. And so if we do have one copy of the Alzheimer's gene, that diagnosis on average for 50% of the population occurs almost nine years earlier at age 75. If we have two copies of that mutation, the APOE4 mutation, it begins at roughly at age 67. I have many, many patients who have two copies of that mutation. I do not tell them I'm so sorry. I tell them the good news is that even though that, that double copy mutation increases your risk by 1,200% compared to those who don't have it, it does not, it is not deterministic. It does not mean that you will eventually get that. It means that we need to work extra hard to address the underlying risk factors because it's the risk factors that increase your risk, not the genetic issue itself. Okay? That's really important to understand. And so when people say, oh, it's familial, I've, I've had family members, I had a patient yesterday uh, that is, another patient saw for the first time, father died of Alzheimer's. His sister died of Alzheimer's, and several aunt, other aunts died of Alzheimer's. And so, and she has out of control diabetes. And, and so she, she has good cognition right now. She's in her mid 50s. 
But the number one goal is protecting, protecting the part of the brain, the hippocampus that controls short-term memory being converted into long-term memory. And that is very possible for every single one of us who are willing to listen to the, 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 the approach, the, the, the strategies that actually work. Okay, so, so the, the, the bottom line is that geneticists are now telling us, like, like Professor Pembury from, from uh, the Institute of Child Health in London is saying, we no longer need to be victimized by our genetics we need to be guardians of our genome. So that's a very different perspective that has just come on in the last few years that genes do not, for the most part, determine our fate, but we need to know what our genes are in order to be able to protect ourselves, to find a different path metabolically so that that genetic mutation doesn't harm us chronically over many years and decades. And so we literally can be guardians, and one of the best and first steps we can take to be guardians of our genome is to undo the risk factors that throw the, throw the, the actually flip on the bad genes and turn off the good genes. Okay, so it was um, Cicero who said, uh, old age must be resisted and its deficiency supplied. Yeah, and it was a beautiful, and so I say dysfunctional genes must first be detected, we should be tested, then supported holistically and finally nutrigenomically bypassed in order to supply their nutrient deficiencies. So I wanna, I wanna cut to the chase here, okay? Um, bottom line is that we have a knowledge in medical science of what is called the exposome, that is everything in our lives, everything that we do, that we eat, that we drink, that we think, that we say, everything that we get exposed to in any way, that is our exposome. And the exposome is what literally turns genes on and genes off. So there's, there's two critical principles that we need to understand on how to turn good genes on and bad genes off, and vice versa. There's two key things. If we, if we could put them all into just two rules, two principles, it would be these. Okay, so first of all, let me, let me just tell you the thumbtack rule. This is uh, from Dr. Sid Baker, a Yale University professor of medicine, who, who was like the Norman Rockwell of, 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 uh, of medical professors. I love the way he taught uh, his medical students. And he said, if you're sitting on a tack, it's going to take a lot of aspirin to make you feel better. <laughs> so point taken, okay, that if we are sitting on a tack, you don't just try to negate the pain by taking something medicinally. You get to work on addressing the cause of the problem, which is you take that tack out of your behind, and now you're going to be okay. Okay, now the corollary to the statement is equally uh, interesting. It's if you're sitting on two tacks, removing just one of them doesn't make you 50% better, right? So, so the, here's the challenge, though, is that many of us are literally sitting on dozens and dozens of tacks. And we, we work really hard to take five of them out, and we, we have worked hard to do that, and then we don't see any actual results of that. It's not because removing those five tacks wasn't necessary and important. It's because removing those five tacks were, was not sufficient. And so our challenge is to not just going back year after year getting the same test and wondering why we're not doing any better, okay? You know, we need to broaden our understanding of what the underlying triggers might be so we can actually find all the tax that we're sitting on and properly remove them. And it's only then that we actually start healing. And that's what we're going to strive to accomplish. So, um, so the, the optimal health and the potential for, uh, for healing requires that we provide all the necessary elements. So these are the the two key principles, we need, we need to provide all the necessary elements for healing to occur, 
and we have to remove the interfering elements. And so this is, again, Dr. Sid Baker speaking from Yale University. And he says, nutrients are the necessary elements. So obviously, what we eat is going to be a critical part of undoing illness. In fact, it's a, it's, it's a necessary, it's a critically necessary component. If we do not address what we're eating, and come to grips with how each of the things that we consume is impacting our health relative to diabetes or dementia or to heart disease or whatever it is. If we don't come to grips with that, we're probably not going to succeed. So that's why any program that has, that has any potential to help you reverse your health challenges needs to thoroughly address this question. And I'm glad to say that as Dr. Westerdahl will lead out in this Diabetes Undone program, that will be a core, core focus. In fact, Dr. Westerdahl has been, been uh, one of the top nutritionists in the world for years. Okay, sorry, I'm calling you out, okay? But he has been. He's uh, been very involved. In fact, at, at the worldwide conferences that I attend, he's in charge of the food. Okay, so that's, why I, that's one of the reasons I go, because I know I'm safe. I'm safe when I go to these conferences. So, um, so nutrients are the necessary elements. Um, toxins are the interfering elements. Now, this goes way beyond what we normally think of as toxic. Anything bad for our body is toxic, right? So we need to consider what those are, and we'll start covering some of those tonight. And we'll go into them in much more detail tomorrow, tomorrow uh, early evening. So... The, I was, I was, I love Dr. Daniel Amen. How many of you know of Dr. Daniel Amen? Just a few of you. He's a psychiatrist who's in Newport Beach, but he has, he has clinics all over the country. I think he has nine, between seven and nine full-blown clinics that he's developed over the years. He's in his early 60s. And, and he, 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 he says this, a uh, powerful statement, he says, you know, when we're talking about loving certain foods, you know, uh, I love ice cream. Okay? I'll, I'll just admit that. Okay? <laughs> I love ice cream. I mean, I'm talking about real ice cream. Okay? However, and this is his point, he says, I'm not going to fall in love with Rocky Road ice cream, even though I really, really like how it tastes. You know Why? Because Rocky Road ice cream, or any ice cream for that matter, doesn't love me back. He says, I am done loving things that don't love me back. In other words, we need to make a choice. Is that if we're going to be doing something that we like, we need to make sure that that thing is actually loving us back, is actually helping us heal, is helping us get to that point where we're having optimal health in every way. And if it doesn't do that, we need to, we need to put it aside. And, and, and here's the challenge. We need to do it joyfully. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the problem because a lot of us will, will eat things that we know aren't good for us because we're, that gives us that little bit of joy we're looking for in that day. We'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow at 11 o'clock. But but um, it reminds me of the, the wonderful words of Gordon MacDonald who said, sometimes you have to say no to things that you really like to do in order to say yes to the very best of things. In other words, so we just got to ask the question. I, I, when I was young, I, I was really into health when I was, li when I was in, in junior high and high school. Uh, I wasn't little, but I was, you know, junior high. And... And um, my mother had just passed away uh, at the age of 10 of a horrible cancer at the age of 39. It shattered my world. It changed my world. It gave me a whole different perspective on risk. And, and that's why I do what I do today. And, and so I, I was contemplating health one day and, um, and, and being challenged by my cravings by my desires, by the things that I love but didn't love me back, right? And, and I remember thinking, says, Wes, 
you got to do today what tomorrow you would wish you had done today. Right? So if we can, if we can on a daily basis uh, uh, come to grips with, with the, our demons, so to speak, Okay, our cravings, our desires that seem so natural and so acceptable at the moment because, well, after all, we're desiring it, so it must be natural and okay. okay? But if we know that it's not going to love us back, we, we need to be willing to say, you know, okay, yes, I like that, but I also understand it's going to create this function in my life, so I'm going to choose joyfully to set that aside. Right? To, to learn how to limit myself in a way that makes me healthier and better for tomorrow. So tomorrow I'll look back and go, yes, I'm so glad I made that right choice. Now, we're humans. We're not always going to make the right choice, but that should be the trend that we're seeking to accomplish. Okay. Uh, so, um, okay, let's, let's just, uh, let me just kind of just run through some of these things real quick. I want to cut to the chase um, can chase us some of these uh, factors. You can watch all these in another video some other time. <laughs> okay, so um, as we start looking at some of these strategies, I actually wrote this, I wrote this on the way here in the car. Uh, no, 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 that's not true. <laughs> I wrote this last Sunday. I typed it out on the, on the slide, but Last Sunday, I had gotten an email from the editor of Vibrant Life magazine. And she said, Wes, I'm talking to various doctors and trying to get their quotes. What, you know, just a short quote of something that they think is the most important thing about health and healing. So I go like, I'm not known for brevity, you know? <laughs> so I, I like to, I have long lists. And so, but this is what I came up with. I says, a knowledgeable doctor can suggest many appropriate simple remedies for our ills. But the foundation of health resides in daily harnessing the restorative power of three pillars. You know, we've heard of the eight natural remedies. We've heard about, but there are three pillars. They're, they're not necessarily the most important issues ultimately, but they are the most important foundational pillars that build the basis for being successful in all the others. So these three pillars, optimal nutrition, exercise, and sleep, Okay, are not more important than forgiveness, are not more important than trust, are not more important than some of the other factors, but without them, you're not going to be able to forgive very easily. You're not going to be able to trust very easily. You're not going to be good at following the other natural remedies. And so that's why these pillars are critical. And I want to concentrate on these for the next few minutes as we begin to explore strategies that are critical for undoing diabetes, for undoing the causes of dementia, for undoing the causes of heart attacks and cancer as well. The, the beauty is when somebody comes to see me, regardless of their main complaint, I know what the foundational strategies are that they need to improve their health. We can always individualize it and with specific strategies or what we call the simple remedies, but everybody needs these three. Without this, the body can't heal. The brain can't heal. The pancreas can't heal if we don't have these three pillars. So I, I went on to say that many do well with one or even two, but few master all three. So I'm speaking from personal experience, okay? So almost all of us may be good at one of these, more rarely good at two of them, but hardly any of us are good or effective at all three. And I'm not saying this is easy. Obviously, it's not, or we'd all be doing it. I'm saying it's something that we have to strive for every day, okay, and, and come to grips with this, with this in our lives, in our regular schedule, and focusing on the things that are best. So, finishing this quote, to achieve the full benefit of one, the other two must also be mastered. This is why. So few of us succeed in reaching our health potential. It's sad, but there is a promise here. There's an opportunity here. If we, if we choose to kind of rededicate ourselves to not just 
having our wellness program being all one of these three pillars that we ex ex expand and explore and now have a sturdy stool with three pillars that anchor this foundation of health, now our health and healing that comes from the one that we champion is much more powerful. So, this, so optimal wellness can only be achieved with this trifecta, this threefold union of the most important foundational pillars at its base for health and healing. Okay, so let's start with sleep. Um, when I was a freshman in high school, I asked myself the question. I'd, I'd been reading the book Ministry of Healing and learned about the eight natural remedies, and, 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 and I asked myself, well, which one's the most important one? I, people have been asking that question you know, for thousands of years. If you got a long list of principles, well, which is the most important one? And, and as I contemplated this for a, several weeks, I, I realized that sleep was the most important one. Now, you could argue that the other ones are more important, but here's the point. If you do not, if you or I do not sleep optimally, we're not getting the benefit the full benefit, certainly, of all the other good things that we're doing. We are greatly, we're, we're turning in 100% correct paper and receiving a C in return. We're just not cutting it. So we're missing out on that, reaching potentially that tipping point that is necessary for us to, for our body and our brain to start healing. So sleep is critical for this. And I'm not saying this is easy. I, I know that a lot of you are thinking, oh, yeah, you don't know about my problems. I've been doing this for 30 years clinically. I know about all your problems. Trust me. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying we have to be committed to the process of figuring it out. Four hours, five hours, six hours, six and a half hours is not adequate. In fact, the research is very clear now is that we need the vast majority at least 95% of the, of the adult population should be uh, shooting for an average of eight hours a night. And I know that ain't happening for the most part of us. Okay, so um, now the, the research is basically showing that it's not just how long we sleep, even though that's a big challenge in of itself, but it's also what time we go to bed and what time we actually get up. Did you know that even independent of each other, what time you wake up, or get up I should say, is just as, in, almost as important as the time that you go to bed. It has to do with setting that circadian rhythm and preparing the body for the next day so that you can go to bed on time properly and actually get the sleep you need. So even if you do not sleep well on a given night, the studies are saying we need to actually get up at a, at a regular time, get outside for at least 10 minutes and experience the healing aspect of sunlight or bright light, and, uh, and then have our meal, and then if we need to re rest some, we can. Do some little light exercise right after the meal, lightly, okay, and then at least we've started today and started that circadian clock appropriately, which now is going to help us be more effective in the next cycle, beginning with, with when we go to bed the next night or that night. Okay, so he, sometimes we, you know, those of us that are older, we, we relegate sleep problems, you know, to babies <laughs> who, who keep us awake, you know, when we're, when we're in those, those early years of, of family, uh, or, or you know, the problems that we have is we just can't sleep as we get older. But the reality is this, not getting enough sleep is devastating even to young adults. And of course, they are well known, young adults, we all have all been there, for being horrible at being consistent with getting enough sleep. We say, hey, you know, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm vibrant, I don't need any sleep, I can get by with hardly any sleep. Well, that's a guarantee that you're prematurely aging and increasing the disease potential in your body, no matter what, no matter how well you think you're handling it. So here's an interesting study. 
Late bedtime is associated with decreased hippocampal volume. In other words, the very little organ the size of a seahorse in your brain that is responsible for taking short-term memories and transferring them into long-term memories. The very seat of memory in our brain, which, we're so, uh, which is so criti critically important, they can lose, that, that hippocampus can lose up to a thousand cells, memory cells, a day by not getting enough nourishment and sleep. So, so basically the study showed that those who went to bed, the later they went to bed, starting at 9 o'clock there, the 2100 hours, and every hour they went to bed later, on average as a, as within the group, it actually caused decreased size of the hippocampus of the brain, meaning brain memory cells are being blown up every night because of that. Literally, you losing up to 1,000 cells a day. Now, here's the good news. For those of us that have been there and done that, we're going like, <laughs> I, there, I have, there's no hope. I did that for so many years. There's no hope for me. No, 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 there is. You know that as soon as you make that decision to find ways to address this the best of your ability and keep working on that, what happens is that your hippocampus starts growing over 700 new memory cells and healing those synapses every day. So you can totally reverse that process and fill in that void. There's actually a gap in your brain from the loss of cells in your hippocampus. How many of you have, I know the story of Glenn Campbell. Glenn Campbell, you know, was, he was uh, the famous country music uh, singer and uh, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And, and uh, his wife uh, very astutely videotaped his diagnosis with his neurologist. You can Google it on YouTube. Uh, just type in Glenn Campbell, uh, diagnosis of Alzheimer's. And you can see the neurologist standing, r sitting right next to him, pointing to the MRI of his brain and saying, see, Glenn, this area right here, this is the hippocampus, the, the area of memory in your brain. And as you see this big white spot, so over two-thirds, three-fourths of that seahorse-shaped uh, area of his brain size of a thumb was whited out and that means there was nothing there he had lost those cells and there's reason for losing those cells and so I wish that Glenn Campbell had had the knowledge we have today if he'd had a doctor that knew what we know right now he'd still be alive I guarantee it that he'd still be alive because there's always a reason for this this is this is not a mystery that we used to think it was many people still think it's a mystery now it's it's a challenge okay but there's definitely things that can be done there's a whole bunch of things that are almost too obvious once you learn about them okay but we need to we need to address all of them at the same time okay so bottom line with sleep it's estimated that uh that sleep disruption ultimately impacts about a third of a person's genes. That means that out of the 20,000 known genes in the body, over 7,000 of those genes are disrupted, okay, are changed, are modified in the wrong direction. Their expression is changed by not sleeping properly. So if there's a, one single thing that we can do to activate our genome to start working for us rather than against us is that we need to get sleep right. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying pay attention. Address this in every which way possible. I spend, I spend an hour with every patient and many times the whole hour is all about how we can improve sleep. Now the good news is that as we pay attention to the other pillars, nutrition and exercise, that helps sleep tremendously. Okay, um, and not always at the beginning, but as we get into it properly and as we time the meals properly, as we, as we it's called the power of when, right? Uh, there's books written about the, the chronobiology, the timing of when we eat, 
when we exercise, when we sleep, when we get up in the morning, all those things are critically important. Okay, so, um, so the, the, what's, what's the last slide on sleep is this. The byproducts of daytime brain function, you know, the brain is like a super, super computer, the most complex, or the, the most complex known organ, in, organ system in the universe, and it's working nonstop all day long like a super, super computer, what, it's, it's, gotta, it's gotta be cleaned up after the end of the day. And that's the only time you can detoxify the brain properly is, is during deep sleep. It's the only time it's gonna happen. You're not gonna be cleaning your house during a big party. Okay, you gotta do it after the party. Okay, you gotta do it when, when things are shutting down, right? And so the glymphatic system pumps cerebral spinal fluid throughout the brain at night, flushing toxins into the circulation in the liver. Now here, Dr. Um, Rudy Tanz, professor of neurology at Harvard University, whose lab has discovered over 80% of the genetic mutations associated with Alzheimer's, he basically said this. At night, during deep sleep, the, brain's liter the, the brain literally sh uh, constricts like a sponge and squeezes out beta amyloid into the circulation, the lymphatics, and that is cleared out. If we're not sleeping properly, we're not getting rid of that plaque that can cause untold damage to our, our memory uh, cells in our, in our brain. Okay, so now I, I would have had a hard time believing that story if it hadn't been the Harvard professor, Dr. Rudy Tenzi, actually saying that almost word for word on a, a lecture that I watched. Okay, and I've, I've actually talked to Dr. Rudy Tansey at conferences. He's a brilliant, brilliant man. Say, so, okay, so let's now move into the next pillar, which has to do with senility of organ systems. In particular, see, when we think of senility, we think of dementia, right? But in fact, senility simply refers to atrophy of an organ as a result of the aging process. Now, I have a better definition than that, I believe, but that's the standard belief that senility just happens with age and it's the, the atrophy of an organ. So when the hippocampus of the brain and other brain regions lose their volume, that means cells are being lost every day, thousands of cells, and so we lose the size of that organ, right? That's, that's where the volume decrease comes from. That's when we do MRIs. They can see, ah, uh, we have, we see those different changes associated with, with decreased brain function. So, so that's senility, but there's another form of senility that is critical also to the brain, and that is what's called sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is nothing more than puny muscle disease. So if we're not on an active exercise program, and I mean active, I don't mean just being busy during the day, which is important as well, but, but an exercise program designed to strengthen the body above and beyond your normal daily activities. Way less than 1% of us gets anywhere near the adequate physical activity during our work. Now I know a couple UPS carriers that come to our office on an on a almost daily basis, they probably get plenty of exercise at work because they're carrying heavy boxes upstairs, sometimes three stories you know, every so many minutes. So they're getting a lot of exercise. Most of you, and me as well, are not getting that. So we're at risk of sarcopenia, puny muscle disease, the very first sign of dementia, the very first sign of dysfunction of the brain is weak muscle. And it's not just an association. It's actually a direct cause and effect relationship. When our muscles are weak, that actually impairs brain function. Because the brain healing requires physical activity to a large extent because physical activity is what turns on the glial cells, the structural immune cells of the brain, and their ability to produce this brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF it's called, which is 
a, a hormonal elixir that literally heals the brain. It's like pouring aloe vera on a bad sunburn. It doesn't just make you feel better. It actually helps heal it. BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, comes from the brain and, and it heals the brain, but it's not produced unless you exercise optimally and eat the right foods as well. Okay, so, so bottom line is that we need to optimize strength training and, and, and essentially, I, I basically, a few years ago, I came up with this term called salupenia, which is the system-wide shrinking and degeneration of tissues and organs not associated or not caused by age, but because of chronic exposure over time to biologic irritants, inadequate, uh, inadequate nutrients, and less than optimal stimulation or activation. In other words, we can prevent the normal uh, uh, senility or atrophy of organs throughout our body, including our brain, if we pay attention to these main underwriting principles or triggers that create this salupenia, this, this and salu is health, penia is small. So limited health and limited ability of the body to heal is caused by the lack of the appropriate stimulation. So exercise is critical. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over some of this and come back to it tomorrow, but I wanna, I wanna end with, um, with a, a, a couple key slides to this evening on the, the third pillar, which is nutrition, which is so, so critical. It's, you know, it's, when, when somebody asks me, says, Dr. Youngberg, what's, what's the most important one? Right, because I mean, it's, it's a great question, but you know what the right answer is? The ones you're not doing. That's the most important one, okay? And so, so they're all important, especially these three pillars, in my mind, they're, they are critical. Uh, I just recently did a survey, you know, I, uh, Dr. West, uh, Westerdahl, you probably did this as well, for the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, and they were looking at the six pillars, included the three I've just shared, but also stress management, okay? But then, then also the importance of social relationships, okay? And then drug and alcohol behavior. Those were the six pillars that, that in our organization we think are very important to be addressed at the clinical level with every patient. And, and um, you know, how do you prioritize six things that are, that are required, you know? You, you, and, uh, and so I actually always put nutrition, sleep, and exercise at the top. Not because it's more important than healthy social relationships. It's not. Social relationships and the art of forgiveness and love is, is far more critical. But here, here's the point. If you don't have those other three, you're not going to be very good at social relationships because your, your biochemistry is going to be so so uh, degenerated, literally, is that it's going to set you up for all kinds of dysfunctional social behavior. There's a great book by Dr. William Walsh, um, uh, who, who uh, it's entitled The Power of Nutrients. And he actually makes the case, he's, he's, uh, he's actually, uh, um, he's an engineer. Uh, I love engineers, because they're a lot smarter than I am. Okay, so he's an engineer that recognized that in, for somebody to have good mental health, they had to fix the underlying dysfunctions of nutritional metabolism. And in his opinion, and I actually agree with him now, I didn't used to, that fixing individual biochemical imbalances with zinc and vitamin B6 in particular, actually more important than the food you eat. Now, once again, it's really hard to prioritize because it's, it's, the food you eat is still important, okay? His point was is that if you have somebody with, with disturbed social behavior, somebody that would just soon shoot you than, than, than say hi to you, 
right? You, you, we've, we've certainly seen them on the news, like Charles Manson. He has a huge disturbance in mineral metabolism. This has been studied by Dr. Walsh and his team directly. And, and he, he has abnormal mineral chemistry and fixing mineral chemistry and fatty acid chemistry with the right supplement actually was shown to be the most powerful strategy in reversing hostile behavior in violent young men who are incarcerated in prison because of their violent behavior. Just simply fixing the biochemistry. Now, so from a timeliness standpoint, from a clinical standpoint, testing that and treating that initially is critical, and then we go in and fix the rest with the whole plant-based diet and the exercise and so forth. Now they can benefit even more from that. So we need to be open-minded about how to addressing these things clinically, being willing to get the right tests done. I've had many patients recently, as we look at the copper-zinc ratio, um, the, the copper is high and the zinc is low. And the copper is usually high not because they're taking in too much copper. The copper is high because they're not taking in enough zinc. And as soon as you fix the zinc, the copper comes right down. Because when you don't have enough zinc in the diet from healthy foods, and this is also a genetically driven problem, that leads to an increased absorption of copper that otherwise would never happen. And it also leads to a dramatic increased absorption of mercury, lead, cadmium, and arsenic. And so by just fixing one of these imbalances of metabolism, zinc, all kinds of beneficial things happen. And now that person is much more capable of reasoning and making good decisions about things that they really desire, but now they realize that's not good for me. And so I choose to joyfully reject that. Otherwise, there's very little chance that that hostile individual is going to do anything that's right and appropriate socially because they just don't feel it. Okay, so, so I'm just presenting to you some pretty dramatic studies that say that we need to pay attention to our nutrition but be aware of what our unique individualized risk factors are. It's, it's, it's good to get on a program that is the pillars, the three pillars that we're talking about tonight are going to be highlighted in the Diabetes Undone program. At some point, it's good to be checking some of the lab indicators, and some of those will be available in the program as well. Okay, so uh, last couple slides. Um, the power of sugar. <laughs> The, it's, 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 it has been said and validated over and over again that sugar is more addictive than cocaine. Okay, and many of us understand that. I understand that. Yeah, I, I've never done cocaine, but who needs to if you get addicted to sugar, right? So, so but here's the, this is an interesting study that relates to the power of nutrition on cognition, and it was a beautiful study done at UCLA, <laughs> and they, what they did is they took, they took mice that were genetically identical, and they ran them through a maze, uh, so they fed them a little, a little treat at the end of the maze, and so these mice very quickly learned how to get from point A to point Z to get their little treat. Uh, then they were all separated from the maze for six weeks and then randomly divided into two groups where group one got Purina mouse chow and, ate, and, ate, and, and basically got some water. But group two got Purina mouse chow and they got water spiked with high fructose corn syrup. Okay, you could just say sugar. Okay, but um, so six weeks later, they were introduced to the maze. And group one, who had had the water and their Purina mouse chow, 
they come up to the maze and they go like, Phew, there's a treat at the end. They knew exactly what to do. They got to point Z, got their treat. Everything was good. Group two, genetically identical mice would come up to the maze and have a deja vu moment. Like, man, this really looks familiar. There's something about this that intrigues me. You know, have you had those deja vu moments when really they should just be the simple memory, right? And, and, and then, oh, eventually they kind of, you know, work their way through the maze. It takes them twice as long to get to point Z to get their little treat because they have literally lost their memories. And the only difference, the only difference between these two groups was the group that had the high fructose corn syrup laced in their water. Not super high amounts, probably less than a lot of us get on a daily basis. The point is, is that any form of refined starch, refined carbohydrate is a significant um, challenge to our hippocampus. Tomorrow, <laughs> I'll tell you a couple stories about myself, okay, which um, are funny, but uh, also, you know, uh, certainly put me on notice that I need to pay attention to this information. Uh, and so I want to end with um, uh, two more slides. <clears throat> uh, President Reagan, I love President Reagan. I thought he was a really cool guy right here from California. Um, you know what his favorite food was? Yeah, jelly beans. You know that there was a bowl of jelly beans in every room of the White House. And, and but see, this is, this is really telling. This is really telling about, see, I wish President Reagan had been made aware of what we know today. Because we, back in his day, uh, from a medical standpoint on Alzheimer's, we literally were living in the age of foolishness. But now we're living in the age of wisdom. There's things that can be done for this to catch it early enough so that that hippocampus, rather than losing 1,000 cells a day, is regaining 700 or more cells a day. And, and so it's, um, you know, the, the story is told here on the slide of uh, uh, where his daughter is, is uh, uh, walking through their house and sees her dad, Ronald Reagan, standing in the living room, just looking around. And she said, Dad, what are you doing? And these are the words that he said, I don't know where I am. And he was in his own home that he lived in for many, many years. So he lost the ability to remember some of the most fondest places he had been. And that is sad because that shouldn't have to happen. And it doesn't have to happen anymore if we're, for most people who pay attention to the underlying, underlying uh, drivers of this. Um, uh, so, and then the, the last two slides for sure, <laughs> Pastor Phil. Okay, that, there's, there's a, in terms of the nutritional strategies, Dr. Terry Walls, um, who is a, a physician uh, I believe the University of Iowa um, Medical Center, she was diagnosed with progressive MS. This was over 30 years ago. She was told to just go home and die. She was told, you know, just what are you doing at the hospital doing rounds? Just get out of here. She was literally in one of these wheelchairs that, that, that she couldn't stand. She, she, she was so fatigued. She had horrible autoimmune, progressive MS, not just regular MS, but progressive MS. And but she, she decided not to give up. She decided that she was going to do everything possible to address her problem. And without going into her whole story, because you can look it up on the internet, and I'm not saying I agree with everything that she does right now, but I agree with her grit, and I agree with the core pillar of her strategy, which is this. And I frequently show, this is her slide that she presented at Cleveland Clinic Grand Rounds several years ago. She said that this is the core to healing the body of almost any chronic disease. 
So it's not, you need to get, and I, I call it the three cube diet. She doesn't call it that, but I know I, I thought that was a good name for it. Where you have three full servings of greens every day. And, and, and I say three servings of cooked down greens. So in other words, have, have three cups of cooked down greens. That's a lot more than actually three servings. In other words, this is therapeutic. This is healing. And if you're trying to reverse a certain condition, we know that this is dramatic in impacting cognition. Seniors who consume even, even less than this of green leafy vegetables every day have a brain function, a cognitive ability that is equal to uh, individuals at least five years younger to them who do not do this. So greens are critical. That, that's number one. Number two is the colored fruits and vegetables. This would include organic blueberries, for instance. I have organic blueberries every morning with my breakfast. But I also, uh, my wife and I, and she made me promise to mention this tonight. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> uh, is to, is to we, we will take, we will stir fry in just a little bit of water. We'll stir fry chopped onions, chopped mushrooms, chopped purple cabbage, maybe some other things as well, and then a whole skillet full of baby spinach, and that will stir fry down to almost nothing, right? And then she takes half, and I make sure I get at least half too, okay? And I eat a, we eat a whole bowl each every morning for breakfast of something like that, and that includes that three cube. Three servings of greens, three servings of colorful vegetables, three servings of sulfur-rich vegetables. Now, that's not the only time of the day that we eat greens and non-starchy vegetables and colors. We actually eat them at every meal, okay? But would you ever imagine that you eat something like that for breakfast? I never did, okay? And it's, it's only been in the last years or so where if I do not get that for breakfast, I am upset the rest of the day. I know that I didn't get what I want. I, I love that. It's crunchy. It's tasty. I, it's, 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 it's really good. Okay? And, and if you, you can actually use a little bit of sea salt on that, especially yeah, almost anybody can use a little bit of sea salt, and that is a wonderful start of the day because I know now that my body is just being infused with healthy nutrition, where now I have, the, have had the opportunity to, to take advantage of the three pillars that are so critical for undoing the causes of diabetes, of cancer, for undoing the causes of dementia and Alzheimer's. Sleep, exercise, and a proper nutrition.